May it please the court, my name is Rick Buckwalter. I represent the appellant in this case, K77 Enterprises, Inc., which appeals a judgment of the trial court, <coughs> excuse me, which appeals a judgment of the trial court finding an oral agreement modifying a written lease between the parties unenforceable due to the statute of frauds. This time I would like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. In November of 1993, the Barbara Jane Durant's trust as landlord leased for 20 years to Harold Costales as tenant of building to operate an IHOP on property owned by the trust, which is next to a motel the trust owned and operated. The lease required the IHOP to pay its own utilities, but shortly after the lease was executed, it was discovered that the power for the motel's lobby and pool area was actually connected to the IHOP's power meter. As a result, in order to save the trust the cost of properly separating the motel's power from the IHOP's meter, the trust's property manager offered to the IHOP's manager, Jimmy Costales at the time, to pay the IHOP's water and dumpster fees if the IHOP would continue paying the entire power bill that included some of the motel's power. Was this verbal arrangement reached essentially at the outset of the lease? It was very close thereafter, according to Mr. Costales' testimony. So despite what's actually in the written lease, the allegation is there was this side deal that I'll pay some of your expenses, you pay some of my expenses, and we won't write it down. That'll just be an understanding between us. Is that the allegation? That's correct, Your Honor. And that was to extend for the term of the lease, presumably? Well, it was anticipated, I think, by the parties at the time that was likely. There was never a time specifically set by the parties as to what that was going to be. The witnesses that testified, Mr. Costales and Ms. Sue Kim, seemed to feel as though the arrangement was to go on as long as the lease went on. I would characterize it more along the lines of so long as the IHOP is paying the cost of the electric, then the motel would pay the dumpster fees. But I think at any time, and I believe it was the testimony of Ms. Kim, nothing prevented the motel from going ahead and making the change that would separate the power. And that's why I say the parties at the time anticipated that it would probably last the length of the lease, but that in fact it was... At the time the agreement was reached, the thinking was that it would go for the term of the lease. I think that was the anticipation of the parties. I don't think there's any question of that. And it did, in fact, go on for quite a number of years. For almost the entire time of the initial lease, which was 20 years, there was a 10-year option to renew. In March of 1999, Harold Costales assigned the lease to his son and general manager, Jimmy Costales, and Mr. Costales' ex-wife, excuse me, Harold Costales' ex-wife, Christina Costales. Subsequently, the appellee acquired the property from the trust. And then a year later, the Costales has assigned the lease to the appellant, and that's why the parties are neither of the parties on the initial lease. As I mentioned, the appellant had preferred that the property be properly metered. In fact, she testified that she only decided to execute the lease after Mr. Costales had assured her that he felt the agreement was fair, and that at one point the owner of the appellant had asked, suggested to the appellee, that it correct the meter problem, but the appellee refused to do so. So at some point, Duvall decides, I don't like this arrangement anymore. I'm not going to pay, I believe it was the trash expense. Is that right? That's absolutely correct, Your Honor. And that's what triggered the lawsuit. That's exactly what triggered the lawsuit. And the gist of the lawsuit was, hey, wait a minute, we had an agreement. We want to enforce the agreement that we've been living by all this time. That's correct. Okay. But the complaint, the amended complaint, doesn't say anything about the statute of frauds. It has a number of counts in it, but all of them go to the issue of trying to get the court to order the other side to abide by this verbal agreement. That is correct. In appellant's initial brief, we raised three issues while the trial court's judgment should be reversed. 
The first is that the Orem modification actually did not violate the statute of frauds. Why is that? That's because it's our position, Your Honor, that the, um, the agreement, although it was anticipated would last the length of the lease, did not prevent at any time that arrangement being changed. If based the, on the allegations of the amended complaint combined with the testimony, isn't there competent substantial evidence in the record from which the judge could have concluded that this was a lease modification that was to go on for the duration of the lease? I believe that the court could have, yes, the court ha could have determined that that was what the so parties why, why, How can we reverse that if the, if the judge's conclusion is supported by witness testimony and by the allegations of the amended complaint, isn't that enough? Isn't that, uh, how, how do we go behind that? Because again, as I've mentioned earlier, the, even though they may have anticipated that it would be the length of the lease, the fact is that at any time, it could have been performed within a period of one year. It was up to the motel had the power to go ahead and come in and correct. That's, the that's one interpretation. But Ms. Sue Kim also says in her testimony that she wanted the judge to tell the landlord that he had to pay these bills until the end of the lease. So that's again, true. isn't the judge within his role within his discretion to find that there's substantial competent evidence that this was a, an alleged me lease modification that was for the term of the lease. I mean, that seems to be what everybody intended. Isn't that a reasonable conclusion? I, I cannot disagree that that would be a reasonable conclusion. Again, I think though under the uh, Supreme Court's case, um, decision in the, I believe it's pronounced Poirier, Browning versus Poirier, that the court is saying in that case that if we look at an agreement, which in that case was two, it was a couple who uh, had a long-term relationship and had agreed to go ahead and split the, um, the pro a lottery ticket, if they were the winnings of a lottery ticket, uh, even though they lived for many years, they um, lived together for many years, and I believe at the time anticipated that it would be for many years, that the court should focus on the actual terms of the agreement and if there's not a specific, a date specified for the duration of the agreement, then it would be considered one of indefinite duration. So are you saying that either side could terminate this whenever they wanted to? Well, I believe that the motel could have, uh, could have done that. Of course, if the tenant, I mean, if either, technically if you, the tenant you, could have as well. So either side, you're, you're saying that either side could have said, look, I'm tired of this paying for you, your bills, you pay for mine, why don't we just each pay our own bills? And that would have been, you're saying that, that that rendered this an indefinite agreement? Yes, but of course in that case, the motel would have gone to, had to go ahead and separate the um, power and corrected the problem. So when Duvall says, I don't want to do this anymore, why, why does your client sue? If they have the right to end this whenever they want, what, what basis do you have to file a lawsuit? Because Duvall didn't separate the power at that <clears throat> time. The agreement was, I characterize the agreement as so long as it's, the power is being paid by my client, then Duvall is required to go ahead and pay that trash, trash fee. Well, really what, you're, what you were looking for then was almost like an accounting, right? I mean, in other words, what you're saying is, look, they didn't meter it, but we're in this situation where we're paying for some of this, some of their power. The lease says we're only required to pay for utilities, et cetera, for the leased premises. And therefore, we, we've overpaid. Let's, let's settle up. But you we, didn't ask for that relief, correct? We do, no, we did not ask for that relief, and I don't think that relief would have been possible. Well, what you asked for was enforcement of the oral agreement for the duration of the lease. That's correct. And that seems to me to be a statute of frauds issue. Uh, That's what you asked for. Th that is what we asked for. And I would say with regard to the accounting, I don't think we could ever have gotten an accounting because how, do you, was, how does one go back and determine how much power is being used before the power is separated or without the power being separated? Um, however, even if in fact the statute of frauds applies in this case, the fact is that the parties have gone ahead and performed on that agreement for numerous years, as we <coughs> indicated, and the courts have indicated uh, in cases going back for decades uh, that 
where a landlord, excuse me, where parties agree uh, to a, a, an oral agreement, even one that would violate the statute of frauds, that that agreement will be enforced. It will be removed from the statute of frauds. However, as what, what you're essentially asking for is money damages. You're, you're, you're alleging a breach of, a, of an oral modification that, that, the, uh, that, that you're, the other side was supposed to be paying some of your bills. You're saying that's been breached and you're entitled to money for that. I don't, know, I don't think we're, re we're requesting money damages specifically, Judge. I think we were asking uh, for specific performance or a declaratory judgment that, in fact, that's what the lease says, that, there, that the modification is enforceable and that we would also obtain damages up to that point in time, which would be monetary. Yeah, one if, aspect of your claim is for money damages. Yes, one aspect of the claim is monetary damages. Uh, it would also be either unjust enrichment, specific performance. Uh, there was a breach of contract claim. Um, however, I will say I, I think after having done research that the courts have said that they, there's a split among the courts that they will not enforce, uh, mon they will not enforce legal damages. Uh, simply they'll act in equity on a situation like this where the parties have in fact uh, performed on the oral agreement for a period of time. Uh, in this case, we're talking about numerous years where both parties, we're all, where both sets of landlords and both sets of tenants have gone ahead and abided by this agreement, and therefore it should be enforced in equity. Um, I, I pointed out to the court as, as far back as 1928 in Pedrick versus Vidal, which is a case involving a landlord and tenant are early agreeing to a term of five year lease but never executing the written lease. The tenant paid the rent monthly, which the landlord accepted, and therefore that was sufficient to specifically enforce the lease. I think it's a similar situation here where even though there's a written lease, there's an oral modification. It's no different than a non-written lease that there was in Pedrick versus Vidal. And because the parties have performed on that, that is, our clients abiding by that agreement, they're paying the electric bill for the motel's um, lobby and pool area, and therefore the court should enforce that agreement, that oral agreement, saying yes, therefore then you have to continue to pay for the trash and water for the IHOP. Uh, similarly, in Crossman versus Fountain, Fountain Blue Hotel Corp, uh, which is a federal case, 273, Federal 2nd, 720, it's a Fifth Circuit case from 1959. Um, that was an oral lease for a dr dress shop and a motel in which the tenant exercised an option to renew. The um, landlord uh, refused to provide the option to renew and started bringing state court action to dispossess the tenant of the property and the tenant filed a federal uh, suit to try to enjoin the, that. The court in that case found that because there had been partial performance of the oral contract, that in fact the court would go ahead um, and enjoin the state, dis um, the, state dis the state action trying to dispossess the tenant because the parties had performed on the lease for so many years. Would you agree that the state of the law is that the doctrine of part performance doesn't apply to actions for the recovery of damages? for the breach of an oral contract? I, be, I believe that's this, that this district falls with. I said there's a split, I believe, among the districts, and I believe in this district that is correct well, that, for monetary that, damages. That would be important for us as members of this district to follow that, wouldn't it? I, I, I do not disagree with that. However, as far as sp requesting uh, specific performance or unjust enrichment, those are equitable matters, not legal damages. And uh, I believe the cases also say that it won't enforce so only So what do you do in a situation damages. where you have a specific performance claim as well as a claim for damages? Then I think we're entitled to, to those damages because it's not what's well, Vis-a-vis the, the uh, uh, statute of frauds, how does that enter into it? Does it, apply, the, does it apply or does it not? It does not because the performance- well, what, if there, what if there's a claim for damages and the law of the district is that part performance doesn't apply? In, to I'm sorry, part damages. performance does not apply? Right. That's that would be a completely different situation. I don't think that's the case in this district, though. 
the um, in this in this district, if there's partial performance by the parties, then there the parties entitled in equity um, to relief, which is what we asked for in our declaratory judgment. We also asked for monetary damages as well, uh, and we also asked for we had a claim in unjust but enrichment. Because, because you asked for monetary damages, because that's a part of this claim. Because at the end of the day, if you don't get the other relief, it's going to cost you money. Don't we apply the statute of frauds? No, I don't think so. Again, I isn't oh, that excuse what me, I have to isn't that what the second district case says in Linkus v. WebMD? I believe that was a case strictly for, mon for monetary damage. In other words, it's strictly a legal damages claim. The case that you cite, authored by Judge, Judge Wyndham, Wisdom, it's an option to rent that the equitable relief is awarded. Is that right in the federal Correct. case? Correct. Okay. I think what Judge Black is saying, if you have a count for specific performance, and that's not barred by part performance, is that all that the trial judge would be able to order them to do, perform as previously done in the past? and not award a monetary damages because that becomes an action at law which seems to be barred in this district. No, I don't think that's the case. And the reason I distinguish that, Your Honors, is because as I read the cases, it's where the only relief being sought is legal damages, monetary damages, <coughs> then that the statute of frauds would apply. In other words, or excuse me, the, the court cannot award the monetary damages. When you're seeking um, Relief and equity, though, the courts will grant that relief and equity if the parties have partially performed on the contract. I they are the oral past 15, but we've taken you past that one, so I'll try to give you back your full five. I'm sorry, Your Honor. If you are past 15, okay. you have reserved five, but we took you past that before I could get you your warning. Okay. Uh, at that, at, with that, you understand, Your Honor, I'll, uh, I'll trust the court on rebuttal. Thank you. Please, the court. Yes, Will you address one, one second? Yeah. I was a liberal arts major. I got to do all the math because I got to make sure you get the same amount of time he has so that I don't have anyone saying, oh, okay, got it. Thank you. Please go um, ahead. What about the part performance argument, um, taking it out of the statute of frauds? This district clearly holds under the uh, Linkus case um, that, that, um, that you can't sue for damages under a par partial performance theory. They're arguing, I believe, from, from the case cited in the brief, that part, the specific performance should be awarded under a partial performance a, a situation. And there is case law that says that, but not under the facts that we have here. We're not in a position where we're saying to the plaintiff, you're not entitled to possession of the premises, um, that you're not entitled to an extension of the lease, or that you're entitled to anything where the court can order us to do something like that. And the cases just don't support an argument that well, I'm not going to, we can't award damages, but we can tell you to go ahead and do what, what you're arguing to do anyways. I, I think that would be a strange exception to the statute of frauds. Um, as far as um, the, the proposition that, in, in this, that this new Browning case, the Florida Supreme Court case, somehow changes things, which has been suggested in the, in the, uh, in the briefs by the, by the restaurant, um, that, this case needs to be read very carefully because the footnote makes the statement that it's to the extent that they recede from the Yates case, uh, they, they do that to the extent that it conflicts. But what, what must be understood is Browning is a case that deals with a contract with no definite term. And, and it's only those contracts of indefinite duration which are really dealt with under Brownings and, and what they're announcing as the exception, because they say after they quote Corbin on, I'm sorry, Will, Williston on contracts. Some cases uh, have Williston, some have Corbin. I, I, okay. uh, stated otherwise, judging from the time the oral contract of indefinite duration is made, that's the main phrase right there. If the contract's will performance is possible, then a year from the inception of the contract, then it falls outside the statute. I believe that just based upon the responses to the court's questions right now, that it's obvious that the intent of what they claim is this oral modification, which I wanted to clarify, uh, that, that this wasn't a finding by, by Judge Ulmer that there was an oral modification of a lease, 
that, that, there, that, that had happened, but that it was just unenforceable. As I noted in my, in my answer brief, the judge never made a finding as to the enforceability or, or not about this. And in my footnote, and I'm not gonna go into great lengths about it here, it seems highly unlikely that, that Bob Crawford and John Morant agreed at the get-go of some 20-year lease uh, that they discovered that they had some sort of problem. Um, and apparently there's separate meters which were there to take care of this problem, that they, that they authorized their office manager to, to degree to some sort of oral modification of a 20-year lease. It's also highly unlikely that um, when this lease was transferred to the, to the present restaurant owner um, and, the cur and, the, and the prior tenant uh, who was, wanted to do everything that was possible to make sure this issue never came up in the future, um, and who apparently was responsible for preparing the assignment document, um, didn't bother to have this reduced in writing at that time. You know, it, it, but I'm, I'm assuming, though. Well, you're, you're making some assumptions about, about the evidentiary you know, findings of the, of the judge. <clears throat> Ultimately, though, the final judgment basically rests and is founded solely on the statute of frauds I, I, issue, which, which leads me into to my question. Um, procedurally, how this got framed to be decided, um, because as as I read it, according to the briefs, what I see, it looks like when the amended complaint gets filed, there's no statute of fraud defense ever filed as a pleading. It uh, there's an attempt to uh, raise a motion to amend the pleadings to conform to the evidence at trial, which to in order to insert this issue of statute of frauds, which the judge denies. And then, lo and behold, we get a judgment that says, "Oh, it really is under the statute of frauds." I, on, help, help me, I, I, help I, me with this. What happened was, uh, my predecessor, Mr. Crow, filed a motion to dismiss when the complaint was filed, specifically raise the statute of frauds as a defense. Yes. Plaintiff filed an amended complaint. Okay. The file shows that Mr. Crow didn't do a whole lot. Finally, got around to filing an answer. They just said, "Admit, admit, deny, 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 deny." Did not raise a specific. I get involved in the case late, and uh, here we are. What am I going to do? Okay, um, it, it's so late. Frankly, I, I can say I can file a motion to try and raise the statute of frauds as a defense. They can object to it, and the judge can rule, and I, this may be gone, right? Um, or I can do what I did. I went to trial. I asked the questions. I interjected the issue. It was unobjected to. And now the judge ultimately ruled. It's interesting that during the trial, in the middle of the trial, um, after the evidence was already presented, and I made my arguments concerning amendment to conform to the evidence, that he denied it. Um, at the conclusion, I gave him all the case law on um, that and other issues. And then apparently, I believe that he read the cases, and they're the cases that are cited in my, in my so, brief. So you, you believe that the way this played out then was at the conclusion of the trial, the evidence, because your defense, you're going second, you raise an amendment to conform uh, to the evidence to now insert this defense. The judge makes a, a, an interlocutory ruling. No, I'm not going to, even though it's the end of the trial, uh, no, I'm not, I'm going to deny it, and then changes his mind. Well, it was actually in the middle of the trial when I made the motion. It was after the state, of, I'm sorry, the state, the, the, the plaintiff had rested. Oh, so before you put before, on your case, correct. you moved to amend. Co correct. And the judge denied it. He just simply denied it. Doesn't that make this kind of particularly troubling, though? Because if the judge denies that motion to amend, then as far as the plaintiff is concerned, that issue's off the table as far as how they're presenting their case. Well, that's where the, 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 the amendment role is, is very interesting because, and under the case law, um, it, it basically says, it, and I can pull up, it's the first case I have on that issue. It's, it, it says that if the evidence comes in unobjected to, then it's really an abuse of discretion not to have granted it. And but everything, and I guess the, the, what, what I'm troubled with is there is no avoiding talking about, if, if you're going to talk about this, this agreement, there's no avoiding talking about the term. So if, if the way you're casting this net is, well, we talked about the term and we talked about uh, you know, whether or not we really had an agreement, 
That's, a, that's enough for there to be a statute of fraud defense. There's, there's no way you could talk about an oral agreement in this context without bringing that up and yet still never really hit the nail on the head as to whether or not it's a true statute of fraud's defense. The, the, how, could, the, you know, how could you try this case without bringing that up? They had to bring in the term of the lease. What, and, 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 and what they are, and what they, their position is on the statute of frauds issue, saying that they had to bring that up and so they couldn't have, uh, they couldn't have objected to it, is my position is what they didn't bring up and what they didn't have to bring up was how long was it to go? Was it to last in, in more than, than the year? Was it to last the end of the term of the lease? And that's the testimony that I elicited. But yes, it was. And so, and there was no objection to it. And I believe that under the case law that that, that issue is not, was properly for the court. And the court, of course, has the, the trial court, um, until the case is over with, has the right to reconsider. The judge is not bound by his interlocutory ruling when he enters his final judgment. Is that the case I, law? I think it's it's like the, the case where these are like written on the sands of the beach and yeah. they can be redone. I mean, the, ju the judge doesn't have to, after the trial, read all the case law, decide, you know what, I probably should have granted that motion, but... I'm stuck. I, I, I'm going to rule for the other side. I think that's what he did. Was he was he reconsidered the case law that had been? And there was no motion for rehearing where K77 attempted to raise this and said, "Hey, wait a minute! You ruled one way. Now you're doing this." I was prejudiced. As a matter of fact, I haven't found anything in the case so far how they of any claim of prejudice by K77 that they would have put on anything different or done anything different or called anybody else had the had the defense been in there from the get go. I agree, and and again, I believe it's a um, except for that wrinkle in the case. I think it's very clear. It's a, it, it's this kind of a sort of case that the statute of frauds is designed to prevent coming forward. We've got a modification of a lease apparently happening in, in 1993 um, that's not reduced to writing that they're trying to take advantage of, um, and the. the Again, not getting trying to argue about what really happened out there. There were some meters, and it would seem that that really wasn't what the deal was supposed to be. But I don't know what happened. I, I don't know what happened with the prior property manager and the prior tenant, and reading the meters and not reading the meters, or, or, or what went on there at all. So, if you have any more questions, I'll be glad to answer them. I just think we've addressed with the issues. With regard to the application of the uh, federal case authored by Judge Wisdom the one that says part performance. My understanding is they went to trial on specific performance. And there are instances where the partial performance will remove the case from the statute of frauds to allow the trial court to order specific performance. Assuming that the trial court was correct in taking everything out else out by the statute of frauds, why would not the trial court have to order specific performance of this agreement? I'm sorry, which case, which you said that's the federal case? Um, the Fountain Blue Hotel Corporation case, uh, 273F2nd 720. There's a passage in there citing a, a great number of Florida cases, uh, and it seems to still be the current law that part performance or of the oh. oral agreement will allow for equitable relief of which specific performance would be one. And so if I understand the pleadings, they went on account for specific performance. If, as you say, the trial court is correct that the statute of frauds bars all the actions at law, that would then mean that the trial court would still have to address in equity the specific performance claim with partial performance and determine whether or not to grant relief. I want to know what your position is on that. I'm not sure if I can do a better job. No, no, I, okay. My position is, if I understand the Fountain Blue case, okay. is that the issue there was, was entitlement option. to possession exercise of the option of the of option for possession and that and, and so in all of the cases cited by the by the, the, the plaintiff in their in their briefs all go to the issue of, of either possession or the right to renew ahead of the time for possession but but that those are the all what they're about and they're not trying to modify a particular term of, of a lease agreement or of an option agreement they're, they're asking the court to enforce the right to the property. That's not an issue here. They're asking specific performance for what they claim is a modification that doesn't seem to fit into any, any case that I've seen.
the specific performance nature of this is they're asking the court to declare the other side to pay some of their bills, That's which is he, sort of like a money damages claim in disguise. And, and actually, if you if you look at the at the the wherefore clause on the amended complaint for specific performance, it. It asks that the honorable court order defendant to pay the monthly cost of garbage expenses for the lease premises deemed required by this court under the lease and award expenses and attorney's fees. It says that under unjust enrichment and also declaratory, it's declaratory judgment claim. In fact, it says that under all of them. So it's really. It's a damage case. Thank you. There are two points I'd like to address to the court. Uh, one was raised by Judge Lucas with regard to the, the waiver claim. As um, it's been mentioned, that was never raised in the, the case as, as a defense. And although the the uh, appellee is stating to the court, or suggesting that um, there was no objection to the testimony and therefore the court really should have allowed it to amend its pleadings. Uh, there's cases that state that if that evidence, <clears throat> excuse me, is evidence that would have come in on the claim that is before the court, then that doesn't allow the um, the defendant to then amend his pleadings to bring up the, uh, the statute of frauds uh, claim there's or defense. A, there's a long line of case law that talks about in terms of discretion of a judge in issuing a ruling, they do not have the discretion to insert an issue or to rule upon an issue that has not been framed by the pleadings. And I recognize that, but to go to a, another point that was raised, really and truly, what would you have done differently in your case? How were you prejudiced? If I can dovetail on that, I read your brief and I didn't read where you've claimed you are prejudiced, that all the evidence has come in, the judge has made a ruling, the statute of frauds applies, your witnesses testified. Anyway, I don't mean to run over Judge Lucas because he raises a good issue, but what difference does it make? And, and, and part and parcel of that, why didn't you file a motion for rehearing and say, hey, wait a minute, we were prejudiced because we would have called this, this, and this person had we known that you were going to consider this? And if I can address your questions in reverse, I think the reason that we didn't file a motion for rehearing is my client felt more comfortable coming directly to the appellate court on the issue based on the fact that initially, the, on several things, initially the court had denied the motion uh, to... Um, to conform to the evidence, and then suddenly in the in the judgment, came back and stay, stated the statute of frauds did apply, uh, even though he had said that they couldn't argue that. And then there were some issues about two separate orders being entered on different dates. So I'm not sure what the confusion was. Just felt that under the rules we had the right not to that we had the right to for a direct appeal. My client felt more comfortable doing that, so that's what we did. Um, what, what, is, what, what would you be asking for even at this point? How, how, what, on what basis would we reverse a judgment other than the statute of frauds? In other words, we can't reverse the judgment because the judge changed his mind from the time he made the interlocutory ruling. That's not a basis for reversal. No, I, I, and I'm not asking the court to do it on based on that. You asked why we didn't do a motion for rehearing. Right. That was why. Uh, what we're asking is that be, even if we weren't prejudiced, excuse me, if I can back up without an answer to that question, I, I, I'm, tr it's, I'm, it's difficult for me to sit here and tell you how we are prejudiced as a result of had this been raised, what would have changed? I think the difference that still applies is the fact that the case, that the agreement was partially performed by the parties, and therefore it takes it out of the statute of frauds, and that's what we're requesting. So, the, so the, the complaint really isn't that you were prejudiced by what the judge did. The, your, your claim is that the statute of frauds shouldn't be applied because of part performance. Fair statement? I think that is correct, Your, your Honor. Uh, and therefore, we're entitled to equitable relief. Um, if the... Either that I, or, the, or the indefinite term, one or the other. 
I'm sorry, Judge. You're either you either want relief based on part performance or or based on the on your claim that it's an indefinite term. That is correct. Um, and, and if it's in that case, you haven't cross appealed saying, "Hey, the judge led us down the garden path here because he ruled one way and then put something different." That's not even that's not before no, us. No, and then that's no, we're not here claiming that, Judge. Uh, it's 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 the the agreement against my client was stuck paying that electric bill. There was an agreement that the certain there would that there would be their trash and their water bill would be paid, and we're asking the court to enforce it. to enforce that agreement and that specific performance. And because there is a period of time, and, and you must be asking for enforcement because that what what you were getting was of greater dollar benefit than what you were paying. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. I really don't know, Judge. I, that's we have no way of knowing. Um, you know, I'm assuming that's well, probably were, the were, case, but do we know? No, we don't know. If you were paying less than you were getting, you wouldn't appear, you wouldn't be here, would you? Well, my, my client doesn't really know. They, they're saying, this is a deal we made. They're now getting less than, because they stopped paying the trash. So we were getting less than we were promised. So yeah, I guess in that respect, yeah, we, we f my client feels it's getting the, the better part of the bargain, but if that's what the bargain is, you know, just because you got the worst part of the bargain, that's too bad. That's what the bargain was. That's what the parties agreed to. Um, <clears throat> as far as it being a, just monetary damages, the reason we're entitled to, to uh, sum up because we're well past the five. I'm sorry, Your Honor. So if you uh, give a quick 10-second summary, we'll be good. As far as the monetary damage is concerned, that's just part of, the, of requiring them to do what they had agreed to do. For the reasons argued, we would ask the court to reverse the uh, trial court's order and uh, remand this case uh, for rehearing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both.